question. There we go. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Massimo Candela. And uh, let me start by saying I have been uh, attending remotely the past two years uh, of uh, meetings. And uh, I have to say it's really refreshing to be back in person and to be among all these uh, uh, nice colleagues. Uh, so my name is Massimo Candela. I'm a senior software engineer at uh, NTT. NTT is uh, a large company that does a lot of things, among which we are a tier one provider, and I work in our global IP network, uh, which is a large network, and we need a lot of software to keep it under control. And what I do, together with some amazing colleagues, is uh, I work on the automation and monitoring of, uh, of the network. And uh, related to this topic, uh, last year, uh, actually one year exactly, uh, I presented at the uh, right meeting uh, uh, and other meetings, a, a platform that uh, I uh, created for uh, addressing, so basically re reducing uh, errors, human errors, uh, and ease the task of uh, uh, during RPKI operations, and um, uh, which is at the moment the platform itself is not the focus of this presentation. Uh, and I received, uh, uh, at the end, uh, a question by uh, Randy Bush, which probably you know him, it's uh, on point, and the question was, um, but what about numbers? Do you have numbers about what type of uh, uh, errors or human errors uh, RPKI related you were doing before, what you're doing now, did the platform work, and, and, and stuff like this. And I thought it was a great topic, actually. Uh, and uh, I wanted, so at that time, I didn't have those numbers. And, uh, but today, I have it. And the presentation is, is about that. And I hope that uh, by sharing these numbers or by sharing uh, our experience, uh, uh, the community can, uh, can benefit out of it. Uh, but let's start with, uh, uh, with some facts. Um, so uh, the 24th of March 2020, at t started doing uh, route origin validation. Um, which essentially means we started doing uh, rejecting RPKI invalid uh, routes. Now, route origin validation together with uh, creating ROS is the basic two steps of uh, implementing uh, RPKI. Uh, one problem, though, is that they are not the only two things. So one does not just implement RPKI and after it's, the task is uh, finished. Uh, but actually, is, uh, uh, RPKI is something that will stay with you during your daily operation, and uh, uh, you have to keep an eye on it. Um, maybe I should have rephrased it. It sounds scary, but it is not. It is uh, actually, um, it, it will require some, some knowledge, of course, but also it will require some additional uh, procedures. That, uh, and, and while some best practices for other uh, technical solutions are right there, for RPKI, some of these best practices, we are still developing them as a, as a community. And uh, so... Uh, what am I talking in particular when I say errors? So in particular, I'm talking about uh, uh, autonomous systems uh, doing uh, RPKI invalid announcement, involuntary RPKI invalid announcement, and it, and it happens. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think there are two big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reasons, uh, common reasons. One end is like you want to announce a new prefix, uh, but you forget completely about the RPKI part. Uh, sometimes you don't forget about it, but I got this feedback uh, sometimes, and uh, you say, yeah, but it's a new prefix, so it doesn't matter. It's going to be unknown, and life will go like uh, it was before RPKI. That uh, can be true, but at least you have to check if it really is going to be unknown, because uh, it's enough that there is a, a ROA with a less, uh, for a less specific prefix already created, and your announcement is going to be RPKI invalid. Or uh, you did not forget about the RPKI part, uh, um, but you forgot about the, the fact that there is some uh, timing involved. Um, in particular, when you create a raw, some uh, uh, publication repository, they take hours, up to 24 hours, to publish uh, uh, those raws. And plus, there is some propagation time that you have to consider so that uh, other organizations, they have to fetch this uh, uh, new row, validate them, so you have to wait their next uh, validation cycle. So you may think that that's not really a problem, uh, but um, uh, it depends what type of, uh, uh, of 
service uh, you are doing with those resources. If you are, for example, managing resources for a large CDN, and you cannot just say, oh, but for two hours, maximum one day, we will have suboptimal routing or reachability. It, it's, it's not. It depends on, on what you are doing with those resources. Um, so what I did uh, um, concrete for, 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 uh, uh, for this analysis, I took our internal logs, internal that entity, so I checked every time we have an installation of BGP Alerter, which is an open source tool for doing BGP and RPKI monitoring. And I took uh, all the internal logs that I had, uh, so essentially logs in which uh, our autonomous system, 2914, uh, was doing uh, uh, RPKI invalid announcement. Uh, I, divide, I checked all the single tickets manually that, uh, uh, for these cases to find the root cause for it. And I uh, created three main categories for this. And uh, the first one is uh, uh, we were, uh, there was a, a wrong max length. So we were announcing, for example, a slash 26, but we had a row with a max length up to a slash 22. Uh, or uh, we announced a customer prefix because we have a, a service agreement with a customer prefix, but the customer didn't have a row for us. Uh, you may think, well, that's a customer problem, but it does highlight that there is a possibility for an improvement of um, communication, at least, or procedure. And uh, the third case uh, was we migrated the resources or prefixes from one autonomous system to another, uh, but we forgot or we didn't do proper raw updating or uh, uh, timely. Um, so there are, uh, uh, I found 171 cases of this. Uh, consider the amount of operations that we do in absolute numbers for the entire 2021, our calendar year is not a lot, but uh, uh, um, so anyway, so I, I, I found this, uh, uh, I divided, I represented here in a pie chart, and uh, you can see that by far uh, the wrong max length is uh, almost 58%. Um, the announcement of customer prefix without the customer having a raw for us is 17%, and I was surprised actually that is 25.5 uh, is about uh, uh, IS migration, uh, but to be fair, there was uh, these numbers are uh, based on a number of prefixes impacted, and uh, uh, there was a single case of migration that was actually impacting uh, a certain amount of prefixes. Um, so now back again with this uh, timing. You may think again, um, yeah, but you know, if it's a publication time uh, uh, issue, then it's going to be fixed. Uh, uh, but it, it's just transient, uh, and, uh, and we don't have those uh, uh, availability responsibilities, stuff like that. So we don't care. But the, the main question I have is that uh, if you are not really monitoring, how do you define that something is transient? How do you know that it's going to be resolved at some point? So just to give a quick answer, uh, I on fly crunch some numbers. This is, only, this is not our, uh, in this case, I'm not using uh, our data, but I'm using the entire uh, ripe uh, BGP data. And uh, for the year 2021, with a, uh, a window of one month. And uh, I'm considering only the uh, RPKI invalid announcement done with the wrong max length. Uh, I took the wrong max length because in my mind, and, and this IDP, this is not peer review. This is uh, something that, uh, just to give an overview. Uh, in my mind, the wrong max length is, as we also saw from our results, is the one more prone to, to be in error instead of being something malicious or something like that. But it still could be anyway. So, um, and you can see that 40% uh, of uh, RPKI invalid for max length, uh, they get resolved in one day, in less than one day, which is OK. Uh, the granularity is per day, so maybe it was resolved immediately, we don't know. Uh, but the thing is that if 40% is uh, in less than one day, then it means that the remaining 60 takes more than one day for sure, and we have a 15% that you can see here at the end, 15% that takes uh, the entire month. So maybe they are still invalid as of today. The, so this highlights that there is some need for a feedback that uh, Probably somebody didn't realize that they are still doing this type of uh, invalid announcement. So how did we address our case or what we uh, did for us? Uh, well, uh, basically these four points. We introduced a new automation platform. Uh, that is the one that I presented um, last year. Uh, we improved our monitoring and released it also open source. And there are some uh, RPKI specific 
um, monitoring in place, we introduce a strict procedure that uh, uh, everybody inside entity has to follow, and we improve the communication with the customer. So these are four different points, but we actually uh, put all of them, uh, they, they all cooperate together. I, I give you an example. The technical solution, so point one, the automation platform, when you have, you want to announce a new prefix of a customer, it will tell you, oh, there is no ROA, so the, basically we communicate to the customer. When the system, the customer creates the ROA and the system sees it, so now then you are able to go. So there is uh, both a, a terms of procedure and technical solution. Um, so, but uh, how, what the impact we have, and, and, and I repeat this, it's only 71 cases and we do a uh, lot of operations in the order of thousands, so it, it's not a big number, maybe it's a bit because we have this, uh, uh, originally we are a Japanese company, so we have this, uh, um, uh, we want to go for, I would say, perfection, and at some point we said, no, this is happening uh, too often for us, and we want to address this, so it was high priority, and then when the 26th of March 2021, uh, we deployed this in, in this system and this procedure that I uh, just mentioned. And from that moment on, um, we actually wanted, of course, to reach zero, uh, but we at least achieved 87% reduction in uh, 2914 announcing RPKI invalid involuntarily. And uh, the, uh, we are almost zero now, and the few cases are, in general, uh, some um, still human error, somebody that doesn't follow the procedure, but we are going to address that. Um, so now we did um, more than um, uh, 500 uh, new ROA created in the system uh, uh, in that year, so the platform uh, immediately start to be used uh, uh, full power. Uh, this is just a quick overview. Uh, this is the dashboard where you have, uh, where we have all our resources, and after you, you can do various things with this. But uh, basically, when you, uh, the, the part about RPKI, I structure it like that. So there is a left column and a right column. Uh, the left column here it says uh, current status. Uh, it is basically the, the RPKI status of this prefix. Uh, according to the current RPKI in the public repository. The future status is actually what is going to be after all these ROAs here at the bottom or the changes that you want to apply, they get applied. Uh, and this is done by basically creating a sort of a test ROAs that after are um, uh, merged together with the public ROAs and we validate the possible future status. But um, more concretely, uh, I... Uh, uh, after various thinking, I came up with uh, this possible solution that uh, it was in my mind the best. It's what I call the four stages of ROAS. And if you want to make the joke that the first stage is denial, that was it's already taken. Um, so the first stage is uh, uh, actually when we create this ROAS and we, uh, uh, it's only in our database and it's marked as staged. Uh, so it's not published, it's just internal. We merge that with the public ROS of the real public uh, trust anchor, uh, and we uh, basically calculate if the future status is going to be valid or not, uh, and, uh, and if it is, uh, then we can commit all of them with an atomic operation. When they get committed, uh, then essentially they are ready to be shipped to public repositories. And when those are visible from public repository, then the platform marks, us, uh, marks it as public. And basically uh, the RPKI status now is up to date and possibly in sync with whatever we want to do in BGP. And, uh, af and we keep monitoring from this moment on forever this resource, but uh, after 24 hours that is, there is no error, we mark it as stable. This is mostly to close the task and just say, okay, with this thing we are gone, we can close automatically the ticket and whatever. Um, so the logic, uh, uh, the, most of the logic that is behind this platform is implemented in this tool called BGP Alerter, which is open source, and you can go in this GitHub repository, you can download it. It's a binary uh, uh, that you can just run or you can compile it if you like it. Uh, it, it, it has auto configuration, it uses public data sets, uh, it, it literally you just run it. You just, it, it you run it, it's going to ask you the uh, autonomous system, and you're ready to go. It does BGP monitoring, so you have a hijack detection, visibility loss, path monitoring, and RPKI monitoring. 
and for the RPKI monitoring, which is the part that we are interested in today, you will receive alerts if you are announcing uh, RPKI invalid prefixes or if you are announcing prefixes that they are not covered at all by ROAS. And I remind you that uh, you can enable and disable this alert. So if you have a partial RPKI implementation, you can disable this alert. Uh, ROS covering your prefixes disappear, uh, for example, because there is a malfunction somewhere in the public architecture or, a RAW, or somebody deleted it. A row involving any of your prefixes or autonomous system was deleted, edited in any way. This is convenient, for example, we have it a channel where uh, uh, basically whoever of, our, of my colleagues does a change, uh, we see them popping in the channel and we basically are all in sync on that. Trust anchor malfunction or corrupted VRP file. Uh, uh, trust anchor malfunction can happen, and at the end I have a, a list of uh, some cases. And, uh, and also it can be just a simple VRP file, which is the output of the validation that can be corrupt for some, for some reason, and you will get notified also for that. Um, or the last thing is um, uh, if a ROA is expiring. Uh, ROA do expire and also all the certificate in the uh, uh, chain of uh, validation. Now this is an example of alerts in our Slack channel. This is uh, what type of diff you get when a ROA is edited. And the last one is an example of invalid announcement that you get notified. Now, uh, I want to do a shout out, some shout out to uh, amazing projects. The first one is the RIS uh, uh, project from RIPE, in particular the RIS Live uh, uh, system that is, uh, we use for the BGP data, receiving the BGP data. It's a, a basically a platform with a lot of route collectors distributed in the world. You can peer with them, basically you send the, your routes, they store it, RIPE NCC stores it, and Everybody can use it. It's a public data set, so for research or for monitoring, like in this case. There is one route collector you can peer, uh, I believe, in Multiop is the number 24, which is hosted by LACNIC. And uh, you can, uh, of course, connect to the website, but since you are here and uh, you are lucky, there is here also Michela Galante. She can answer all your questions and she can uh, help you if you want to peer. Uh, the second project uh, is the OpenBSD RPKI client, uh, uh, which is basically the only RPKI validator for now that uh, introduces some exporting of metadata that make my life extremely easier uh, when uh, about uh, raw monitoring, in particular uh, for expiration of ROS, and a, a big thank to Job Snyder for, for working on this. And uh, of course, and manners uh, for the uh, mutually agreed norms for router security. The amazing part, that recently uh, I became an ambassador of this, so if you have questions, you can approach me, but the, the, the most interesting part of this is that it's not something abstract, it really has a list of concrete steps that you can take. Uh, if you are an ISP, an IXP, CDN, or a hardware vendor, uh, which was uh, recently added. And um, yeah, it, it, it also there is a great community around that they can help you a lot in, in deploying such solution for the uh, routing security. Um, now, let's, uh, uh, before to conclude my presentation, uh, I would like to show a list of uh, uh, public RPKI infrastructure malfunctions, so the trust anchor malfunctions that I was talking before, which uh, occasionally can happen. Um, why you want to get notified? Why we introduce that? You want to get notified because um, otherwise you may be spending some time doing debugging on something that is not something that you can fix, but instead you would invest better your time by informing timely uh, the, 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 the trust anchors itself and, it, and basically helping the entire uh, community. So the, 12 of, the first case, 12 of August 2020, BGP Alerter reports many prefixes no longer covered by ROA. At that time we didn't have RPKI uh, um, we did have trust anchor monitoring, and uh, I received some messages, some also in the GitHub, that they were saying, oh, um, uh, it could be a false positive. Uh, we start doing uh, uh, some deep debugging, and uh, together, uh, Job Snyder, the RPKI client team, and the Arin team, they do a, a long call at night. They find that basically Arin was publishing uh, certificates with, uh, uh, in, in a wrong way. There is a, an entire report you can go read for details. But at that time, I realized that then we really needed some trust anchor monitoring in a way that we have more actionable alerting without spending time trying to 
uh, uh, randomly debug stuff. Uh, and uh, the 6th of February 2021, the first time we actually saw this in action, and uh, Twinicroc disappear. BGP alerter sends the alert, and the, we have that after they get reported, hardware failure uh, officially reported by Twinic. On 18th of March 2021, uh, we discovered that we missed in a validation cycle some ROS from RIPE, and we remember that this happened already in the past. Then, uh, thanks also to a colleague, which is uh, Colin, uh, that uh, basically did some log digging, we find that uh, uh, in the repository there were uh, manifests referring to certificates that they were not there. And uh, we give this report to RIPE NCC, they fix it, they do an official report about it. Essentially, there was uh, like, a, the, uh, if you were doing R-Sync while the repository, the public repository was getting refreshed, you maybe were getting some old and new data at the same time. The 17th of June 2021, we discover, uh, uh, this is a, uh, is a nice one, because we discovered NACNIC disappearing over R-Sync, RRDP was uh, working, we WhatsApp our friends at LACNIC, it was amazingly fast. They fixed it, everything in less than half an hour, and I think nobody even ever noticed that. Um, the power of uh, networking at conferences. And the 1st of February 2022, uh, uh, JP Nick uh, had a partial trastankor malfunction uh, where several ROS were expiring, expiring soon. And we have uh, the alert here with the list and a considerable amount of ROS. And uh, we report this to JPNIC, uh, to JPNIC, and they managed to fix it one minute before expiration. So also in this case, uh, nobody was impacted by it. Uh, 16 of February 2022, RRDP of RIPE is, becomes unreachable and uh, also R-Sync because all the clients were moving to R-Sync and too many connections. So BGP Alerter also detects the issue. We reported to RIPE. At that time, RIPE was already aware of it. They were already working on it, uh, and they deployed a fix. It was a DNS misconfiguration. They deployed something, and it got fixed uh, also in that case uh, pretty soon. Um, so my presentation is over. Uh, if you have questions, that is the time. And uh, you, you have also my contact. Uh, I will be remain here for the entire conference, or you can follow me on Twitter, uh, where sometimes I discuss also about this topic, and I have updates about open source software and stuff like this. Thank you very much for your attention. Vamos a dar el micrófono a Jorge Villa para que pueda moderar la pregunta. We'll give the microphone to Jorge Villa. Uh, ¿Alguna pregunta para Máximo? Any questions for Máximo? No questions for Máximo. I have a question over here. I have a question commented on malfunction of the system, so I'm going to ask the question I have here. How operators can be impacted by this? Thank you for the question. So actually, it's a, yeah, interesting question. So um, disappearing ROS, uh, they can uh, disappear for various reasons. It can be a trastankor malfunction or a raw gets deleted or uh, it just expires. Now, uh, it, it goes back to unknown, to the status unknown uh, in theory. Uh, but two things can happen. Uh, uh, one thing is that uh, if there is a partial, uh, uh, so for example, some raw disappears, some no, some no uh, you can go back in the case of RPKI invalid max length, uh, then basically your, your uh, announcement is going to be RPKI invalid. But even if uh, it just goes to unknown, um, you have this, uh, uh, there, there are like still uh, software bugs and luckily most of which were uh, uh, fixed, software bugs in uh, routers, where essentially some routers were moving from the status valid to unknown, passing by invalid. 
So this means that you basically those prefixes that they were raw disappearing, they were just not switching to a known, but they were dropped. And if this happens with an entire trust anchor, for example, you are going to drop other space for maybe ripe uh, or something like that. That it is uh, uh, so. Uh, yeah, in a perfect world with no software bugs, uh, that is not a problem. But uh, unfortunately, we verified that it is a problem. Any other question? Yeah, I have another question. Yeah. Another question from Hugo Salgado de Chile. This is another question from Hugo Salgado. Any difference between running RPKI in hosted or delegated mode? Do you know of any variable that makes one of these mechanisms more prone to operators ever? Uh, this is uh, actually a really interesting question, and I wanted to spend some time investigating about this. At the moment, I do not have uh, an answer that is based on, uh, on science, but I can tell you that for um, one of the things that I noticed with the growth of uh, self-hosted is that some, um, some hosts, they, uh, sometimes they may take long to, to actually uh, reply and uh, that can slow down the entire validation uh, download and, and, and process. Uh, but I do not have at the moment any number or any specific advice that is based on, on any research. So I would not uh, go farther than that. Okay, yeah, many thanks. Alguna other pregunta para Massimo? Are there any other questions for Massimo? Any other questions? No more questions? I think there are none. So a round of applause for Massimo.